Good morning, everyone. It is awesome to be back with another power pack session on our thought leadership series, Future Generally Master Speak. I hope all of you all who are watching this show and your families are safe and healthy. I welcome all our audience today for this session and thank you very much for joining us. Now, all through the three phases of the current lockdown, we try to keep you engaged meaningfully with our Lock-in Good Habits program, where we continue to run the live sessions with experts to keep you healthy, fit, and in good spirits. So if you haven't joined us in those sessions, do get on uh, to those sessions with your friends and uh, make sure that you stay healthy and you stay, fist, uh, stay fit. Our current series, uh, Future Generally Master Speak, is all about your questions and concerns as to how the present situation will impact your future businesses, our jobs, careers, etc. And how might we be better prepared to deal with this adversity? And how uh, should our game plan look like if you were to emerge stronger from this adversity? Now, these are truly unprecedented and uncertain times. This program, Master Speed, is a part of our Live the Community Initiative, uh, as we hope to create a better, brighter, collective future for all of us. I am truly humbled to share that we have completed about 13 sessions with some of the greatest minds and stalwarts of our times who have openly shared their experiences and wisdom with us. I have personally gained a lot from these sessions. And today we have another highly distinguished speaker on our show. And personally, I'm very excited to learn from this master. I love his work and I've heard him speak on previous occasions. So I can tell you firsthand that you are in for a treat today, folks. So without hogging more time away from our speaker, happy to introduce one of my favorite authors, Neer Eyal, on this show. Neer writes, consults, and teaches about intersection of psychology, technology, and business field that I love the most. MIT Technology Review dubbed Neer the prophet of habit-forming technology. Now, Neer founded two tech companies since 2003 and has taught at Stanford Graduate School of Business and the Hasso Plackner Institute of Design at Stanford. He is the author of two best-selling books, Hooked, How to Build Habit-Forming Products, and Indistractable, How to Control Your Attention and Choose Your Life. And we're going to hear more about this in the session. If you haven't had an opportunity to uh, read either of these, these two books, I would urge you to post the show. First thing that you should do is to get these books. Now, Indistractable received critical acclaim, winning the 2019 Outstanding Works of Literature Award, as well as being named one of the best business and leadership books at uh, the Amazon and one of the best personal development books of the year by Audible. In addition to blogging at neilandfar.com, Neil's writing has been featured in the New York Times, the Harvard Business Review, Time Magazine, and Psychology Today. Neil is also an active investor in habit forming technologies. Some of his past investments include Eventbrite, Anchor.fm, which is acquired by Spotify, Kahoot, which is my and my kids' favorite. We use that a lot uh, when we sit together. Refresh.io, which is acquired by LinkedIn, Product Hunt, and the list is long. So without taking more time away from Neer, I'm happy to introduce Neer Ayal to our audience. Neer, over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much for the wonderful introduction and welcome everyone. It's great to be with you virtually here today. Let me go ahead and uh, share my screen with you so I can bring up my slides. And uh, hopefully you can see them now. Okay, terrific. Well, welcome everyone. It's so good to be here. Oops, let me just do that again here. Okay, uh, let me just start out by saying a bit about my background and my story. So a few years ago, I published this book. This was my first book called Hooked, How to Build Habit-Forming Products. And the book went on to become a bestseller, uh, and it uh, sold about a quarter million copies. It's, it's uh, uh, I, it amazed me more than anyone how well this book is done. And the reason I wrote my first book was to democratize the techniques that companies like Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and WhatsApp and Slack and Amazon and Google, how is it that all of these products and services are so good 
at changing our day-to-day behavior. That's what I wanted to find out so that I could build the kind of products and services that bring people back. And so that's why I wrote Hooked, not for the benefit of the gaming companies and the social media companies. They knew these techniques for years before I wrote the book. I wrote the book so that everyone can benefit from the same psychology that makes those products so sticky. And that's exactly what's happened. Companies like Kahoot, that uh, today is the world's largest educational software, uses the hook model to keep kids hooked to learning. Uh, Companies like Fitbod get people hooked to exercise. I've worked with clients like the New York Times to get people hooked to engaging with current affairs. So we can absolutely use these techniques for good to build healthy habits in people's lives. But of course, there is another side to the coin that the other side of building good habits is that sometimes we find that we have some bad habits in our life. And so I had to reassess my own relationship with distraction a few years after I wrote this book, when there was one seminal moment in my life that I'll never forget. You see, a few years after writing Hooked, I was sitting with my daughter one afternoon, and we had this beautiful afternoon planned, a time for just daddy and daughter to spend some quality time together. And we had this book of activities that we could do together. And one of the activities in this book was to ask each other one question. And that question was, if you could have any superpower, what superpower would you want? Now, I remember that question verbatim, but I can't tell you what my daughter said, because in that moment, that was the second that for some reason, I just had to check this one quick thing on my phone And by the time I looked up for my device, I realized that my daughter was gone. She had left the room and decided to play with some toy outside because I had told her by using my device that whatever was on my phone was more important than she was. She got the hint and she left the room. And that's when I realized that I'd blown this perfect daddy-daughter moment. And if I'm honest with you, it didn't just happen with my daughter. It would happen when I would sit down at my desk as I'm guessing it happens to many of you. You sit down at your desk and you say, I'm gonna do this one important thing. And yet 20, 30, 40 minutes later, you're doing something that you didn't plan to do. It would happen in my, in my life outside of work as well. I would say I was going to exercise. I would say I would eat right. And yet I wouldn't do those things. And so if you ask me today, what superpower I would most want, I would tell you I would want the power to become indistractable. You see, becoming indistractable will be the superpower of this century. This is the macro skill that affects every single facet of your life, whether it's your health, your your personal wellness, your happiness, how much money you make. All of these things are dependent upon your ability to follow through, to do whatever it is you say you are going to do. And so I spent the next five years researching an age old question. Why don't we do what we say we're going to do? You see, maybe previous generations could say that the problem was that they didn't know what to do, right? But today we don't have that problem. We can't use that as as an excuse. Who doesn't know how to lose weight? Who doesn't know how to have better relationships? You know, who doesn't know how to be better at their job? You got to do the stuff that other people don't want to do. It's not rocket science. And frankly, if you don't know what to do, that's what Google is for. We all have access to the information. We're drowning in information. The problem is no longer that we don't know what to do. The problem is we don't know how to stop getting distracted. And so one of the first things I was surprised to learn is that this is not a new problem. That in fact, 2,500 years before the iPhone and Facebook and Google and all these things we think are distracting us, Plato, the Greek philosopher, had the very same problem. Plato called it akrasia, the tendency that we all have to do things against our better interest. And so the fact that people have been struggling with this for at least the past 2,500 years tells us the problem is not our technology. We love to blame those things. But that's what we call the proximal cause, not the root cause of the problem. So let's dive into the root cause. What really causes distraction? Why do we do things against our better interest? What is the nature of what Plato called akrasia? Well, the best place to start to understand what distraction is, is to understand what distraction is not. Think for yourself for a moment. What is the opposite of distraction? 
Most people will say it's focus, but that's not exactly right. You see, the opposite of distraction is not focus. The opposite of distraction is traction. In fact, both words come from the same Latin root, trahare, which means to pull. And you'll notice that both words end in the same six letters, A-C-T-I-O-N, that spells action. So traction, by definition, is any action that pulls you towards what you want to do, things that you do with intent that move you closer to living out your values and being the kind of person you want to become. The opposite of traction is distraction, any action that pulls you away from what you plan to do, anything that is not uh, in, a line, in, in coordination with your values and pulls you away from being the kind of person you want to become. Now, why is this so important? Because any action can become distraction or traction, any action. Let me give you a great example. You know, I wrote this book for me more than anyone else because I've never had a lot of self-control. I've never had a lot of willpower. In fact, I used to be clinically obese at one point in my life. I was a chronic procrastinator. And so I wrote this book for me more than anyone else. Now, one thing that I got into a very bad habit of doing and maybe this will ring true for you as well, is that I would sit at my desk in the morning and I'd say, okay, now I'm gonna stop procrastinating. I'm gonna work on that big project. I'm gonna finish that big assignment. I'm gonna do that thing that I've been delaying. Here I go, I'm gonna get started. Nothing's gonna stop me. I'm gonna start right away. But first, let me check some email, right? Has that ever happened to anyone? It happened to me all the time and I would justify this behavior by saying, well, I'm checking email. That's an important thing to do. That's a work-related task, right? Let me just check that email or do that one thing on my to-do list real quick. And what I didn't realize is that I was allowing distraction to trick me into prioritizing the urgent at the expense of the important. And that is the most dangerous form of distraction. It's not when you're playing, you know, on WhatsApp or a video game or something. That's a clear distraction, right? We all know that we're slacking off when we're doing those things at work. But when we think we are being productive, checking email, doing that thing on the to-do list, if that's not what we plan to do at that time, it is just as much, if not more so, of a distraction. So anything can be distraction and any action can be traction. So a lot of times you hear these days this vilification of technology, that technology is melting our brains, that it's manipulating us, that it's addicting everyone, that it's hijacking our brains. And that is rubbish. It is not true. Don't you believe it? The science doesn't support it. And in fact, it makes the problem worse. Because look, there's nothing wrong with these technologies. It's very elitist for some professor without a social media account to say, oh, everybody just stop checking email and social media. We, no, we can't do that. We'll lose our jobs if we stop using these products and services. And why should we? They are wonderful at connecting us to people, especially now that many of us are working from home. These are absolutely wonderful tools and services. So we shouldn't vilify them. We should make sure that we turn what would otherwise be a distraction into traction. How do we do that? With one word. And that one word is intent intent. Because simply by planning out what it is we want to do, we can turn distraction into traction. Now, we're going to get into exactly how to do that in just a bit, so stay tuned. But let me talk about, just to complete the indistractable model, I want to talk about what prompts us to take these actions, either towards traction or distraction. Two things. The first thing is what we call an external trigger. An external trigger is something in our environment, a ping, a ding, a ring, a notification, anything in our environment that prompts us towards either traction or distraction. Now we'll get back to what we can do about those external triggers in a bit, but I wanna to talk to you about the number one source of distraction. You see, the number one source of distraction, it's not the external triggers, it's not the pings and dings. In fact, studies find the number one source of distraction is not the triggers that occur outside of us, but in fact, it's what occurs within us. You see, most distraction begins from within. And so on our journey to become indistractable, we have to start first and foremost by understanding our internal triggers. You see, all procrastination, all distraction has one source, and that source is the desire 
to escape discomfort. All distraction. It's not a character flaw. There's nothing wrong with you. You just don't have the tools yet to deal with uncomfortable sensations in a healthier manner. And so the place we have to start to understand why we get distracted, it's not blaming our technology, it's not blaming other people, it's not blaming modern times. It's about understanding what emotional sensation are we trying to escape? Because look, I have spent the past five years reading every productivity tip, every life hack, everything that you could possibly do. And I'm here to tell you, none of them work. None of them work unless first and foremost, we deal with these uncomfortable emotional states. Because whether it's too much news, too much booze, too much Facebook, too much football, it doesn't matter. All of these distractions have the same common origin of an internal trigger, an uncomfortable emotional state that we seek to escape. So what does that mean? It means that we only have two choices when it comes to mastering these internal triggers. We can either fix the source of the problem, so fix whatever it is that's causing us this discomfort, whether it's a difficult home life, uh, an oppressive workplace culture, whatever it might be, fix the source of the discomfort. Or where we can't fix the problem, we have to learn tactics to cope with that emotional discomfort that leads us to escape. Now, what we have to realize is that because all distraction begins from this desire to escape emotional discomfort. That therefore means that time management is pain management. Let me say that again. Time management is pain management. We have to learn how to cope with that discomfort in a healthier manner. So let me just give you a few techniques. So one thing that psychologists tell us is just simply the act of noting the sensation right? Very few people do this. They don't believe how powerful it is. But in fact, studies find that by simply writing down what is that sensation, boredom, loneliness, fatigue, anxiety, stress, whatever it might be, by simply writing it down on a little piece of paper by your desk, that is the first step to helping us gain agency and control over these sensations as opposed to letting them control us. The next step is to get curious rather than contemptuous. You see, many people, they fall into two categories when it comes to distraction. We call these the blamers or the shamers. The blamers, they blame things outside themselves. It's Facebook, it's WhatsApp, it's email, it's the modern world. I hear this all the time. It's the modern world these days that makes it such a distracting time to live. The problem with that argument is that there's nothing you can do about it. We don't have time machines to go back to some mythical time when there wasn't distraction. That time never even existed. So being a blamer is futile. As well, being what we call a shamer is also not a good strategy. A shamer doesn't blame things outside themselves. They shame themselves. So that's what, here's what a shamer sounds like. A shamer says to themselves, oh, there I go getting distracted again. I always do this. I have a short attention span. Uh, I'm not very good at this. They shame themselves thinking that it's them that are the, that they are the problem. There's something deficient about them. And of course, that only makes the problem worse because what do we do when we feel shame? We feel more of these uncomfortable emotional states, more of these internal triggers, which means we become more likely to seek distraction, to take our minds off of the very sensation of shame that we are feeling. So we don't want to be a blamer. We don't want to be a shamer. We want to be what we call a claimer. A claimer claims responsibility, not for their feelings. You see, you have no control over what you feel or the urges you experience. Just like you don't have, a, you don't have control over the urge to sneeze. Right? Once you have the urge to sneeze, it's too late. You've already felt it. You don't control it. What you do have control over is how you respond to those sensations, what you do in response to those urges, hence the word responsibility. And so like a sneeze, when you feel the urge to sneeze, do you sneeze all over everyone? No, you get a handkerchief and you cover your mouth so you don't get other people sick. And the same goes when it, when it comes to dealing with our uncomfortable sensations. When you feel uh, lonely, you automatically check Facebook. When you feel uncertain, you impulsively check uh, Google. 
When you feel bored, are you automatically watching the news or checking stock prices or going on Reddit or Pinterest or WhatsApp or whatever? Or you ask yourself, is this serving me or am I serving it? Are you asking yourself, how can I get curious about that sensation rather than contemptuous? So let me give you one very powerful technique that you can use today to help you start mastering these internal triggers. And this is one of many, many techniques, but let me give you one technique that I use all the time. This is called the 10 minute rule. The 10 minute rule acknowledges that these emotional sensations that we seek to escape from, they crest and then they subside, just like a wave. And so your job is to ride that wave like a surfer on a surfboard. This is called surfing the urge. Now, what I want you to do, the next time that you feel an urge to do something that leads you towards distraction, whether it's uh, check email when you want to work on that big project, whether it's eat that piece of chocolate cake when you know you should hold back, whatever it is, any temptation that can lead you towards distraction, what I want you to tell yourself next time is that you can give in to that distraction. You can give in in just 10 minutes, not right now. Okay, not right now, not for 10 minutes, listen carefully, in 10 minutes. So for those 10 minutes, what I want you to do is one of two things, either get back to the task at hand, get back to the thing that you said you would do with your time, or just sit with that sensation. So many times what I'll do is I'll take out my phone, I'll say, set the timer for 10 minutes, I'll put my phone down, and I'll have time to get curious about that sensation. What is it that I'm experiencing? How can I surf that urge to let it crest and then subside. And what you will find is by the time that timer goes off, those 10 minutes have elapsed, you're back at work doing the thing you wanted to do and that urge has passed, okay? So getting curious about that sensation rather than contemptuous, using the 10 minute rule to help us ride out that urge, very, very effective. Now, again, there are dozens more techniques that you need to learn so that next time you experience these uncomfortable states, you're not reaching for distraction, but instead you use these tactics that I teach you in my book, Indistractable, to help arm you against getting distracted so that you let, are led towards traction rather than distraction. Okay, so that's step one to becoming indistractable. It's all about mastering the internal triggers. Step two is about making time for traction. Again, we talked about how traction is any action that leads you towards what you want to do with intent, things that lead you towards your values. So the next step has to be to understand that you cannot call something a distraction unless you know what it is distracting you from. Let me say that again. This is a very important point. You have no right to say you got distracted if you don't know what you got distracted from. How can you say you got distracted if you have blank white space on your calendar every day? It doesn't make any sense. What did you get distracted from? So I hear this all the time with folks. And many times, you know, people will complain to me about how distracting the world is these days and they can't seem to focus, they can't seem to get things done. And I say, well, how did you intend to spend your time? And they say, oh, look at my to-do list. I have so much on my to-do list that I didn't get to. And I said, no, you didn't hear the question. I said, how did you intend to spend your time? Because the fact of the matter is, if you don't plan your day, somebody will plan it for you. The news, your boss, your kids, your spouse, Somebody has an incentive to take your time away from you if you don't decide in advance how you want to spend it. Listen, there's a reason we call it paying attention. We pay for attention. It has value, just like we would pay money. And yet many of us, we just give anybody who wants our time, we just give it to them, okay? Uh, parents, kids, teachers, bosses, the news, Twitter, take it, take all my time. The fact of the matter is if you don't plan your day down to the minute by using what's called a time box calendar, as you see here, somebody's going to take that time away from you. So this technique is no longer optional. When you look at the most productive people on earth, they all already do this. Even though a tiny fraction of the general population does, the high achievers in the world, the people who really get things done, who are happier, wealthier, smarter, they keep these time box calendars. Now I know for some of you, oh, that looks like a lot of work. I'm not sure if I wanna do that. That looks too rigid, tough. Are you struggling with distraction? Do you wanna stop struggling with distraction? Then you have got to plan your day or someone else will. What I want you to start doing is to plan the time, not the output. 
Listen, many of you think that the pinnacle of productivity is using a to-do list because somebody told you about a book or something or a guru that says that to-do lists are the miracle cure to get things done. Let me ask you a question for those of you who keep to-do lists. When was the last time you didn't finish everything on that to-do list? Think for yourself, if you keep a to-do list, when was the last time you didn't finish everything on the to-do list? I bet I know when. Today and yesterday and the day before that. And oh yeah, probably the day before that because I used to do this myself. I would keep a to-do list with all these things on it and I never finished everything on my to-do list. And what I didn't realize and what the psychology literature revealed is that behavior change is identity change. That when we see ourselves a certain way, we conform to that belief set. And so what message are you sending yourself if you have a to-do list that you never get done? You are repeating to yourself day in and day out that it's okay that you don't live with personal integrity, that it's okay to lie to ourselves, to think we're gonna get all this stuff done and we don't. And you think, oh, big deal, it doesn't have that big of an input. No, not true. That in fact, day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, if you're telling yourself that you're not gonna get those things done and that's somehow okay, you've already lost the war. So what do we do instead of using to-do lists? To-do lists are killing your productivity. Instead of a to-do list, we need to keep a time box calendar. And the metric of success for a time box calendar is only one thing. It's not about getting things done. It's not about finishing anything. Wait, what? Did you hear what I just said? The metric of success is not finishing anything. The only metric of success is did you work on whatever it is you said you wanted to work on for as long as you said you would without distraction. That's it. Did you work on the thing you wanted to work on or do, by the way, if you wanna play a video game for an hour, great, do it. There's nothing wrong with that as long as it's what you plan to do. But did you do that for as long as you said you would without doing anything else? Here's the kicker. The people who use those time box calendars and measure themselves by only the metric of did they work on the task without distraction for as long as they said they would, they finish more than the people who keep the to-do list. Isn't that amazing? So this is a practice we all need to start doing. We need to also make sure that we spend more time concentrating and less time communicating. You see, so much of our day is spent doing reactive work reacting to emails, reacting to notifications, reacting to what our kids, our parents, our spouses want, that we have very little time for reflection. That time to plan, to strategize, to think for God's sakes, it has to be in your schedule. Make time for it. It is a huge competitive advantage. The people who put time in their schedules to think are the ones who get ahead and live the kind of lives they really deserve for themselves. So make sure you make that time for focused work, time to think in your day. Now, part of the reason that all this communicating is so troublesome is that it comes coupled with what we call external triggers. External triggers are the pings, the dings, the rings, all of these things in our outside environment that can lead us towards distraction. Now, there is one industry where distraction is literally a matter of life and death. If I were to ask you, what was the third leading cause of death in the United States of America in 2019, the third leading cause of death, believe it or not, the third leading cause of death after cancer and heart disease was prescription mistakes. Prescription mistakes. People inside hospitals receiving the wrong medication or the wrong dosage of medication. And by the way, this is not a problem only in the United States. This is a worldwide problem that most people, most hospitals, most countries, they say, well, what are we gonna do? It's the cost of doing business. People in hospitals make mistakes, right? Until a group of nurses at UCSF decided to take on this problem and figure out why was this happening? Why were nurses giving patients in hospitals the wrong medication? It turns out what was happening is that nurses were interrupted on average 10 times per dosing round. A doctor would ask them a question, a fellow nurse would interrupt them, and every time they were being interrupted, they made mistakes. This this, uh, when, once this team figured this out, they came up with a solution that reduced prescription mistakes by 88%. They almost eliminated this problem. You know, you wanna know what they did? 
It wasn't some multi-million dollar technology. It wasn't some crazy training program. Here's what they did. They asked nurses to start wearing vests, these plastic jackets that they wore that you can see here over their outfits that told their colleagues a drug round was in progress. They were dosing out medication. Do not disturb. An incredibly effective technique that reduced the number of prescription mistakes. Now, why am I telling you this story? I, I'm telling you this story because all of us can use the same technique that these nurses learned. You see, when we go back into the office, you know, many of us work in open floor plan offices where we're constantly interrupted by someone asking us for uh, a, something that they need or passing on some bit of office gossip. This turns out to be the number one source of distraction in the modern workplace. It's not computers, it's not cell phones, it's other people interrupting us. So when we go back in the office, one solution is to use what we call a screen sign. In every copy of my book, Indistractable, there is a free screen sign right in the book. It's a piece of cardstock. You pull it out, you fold it into thirds, and you put it on your computer monitor. Now, I know many of us today, we're working from home, right? So we don't have our colleagues interrupting us. We have our children or our spouses interrupting us. And so what do we do in that case? How do we make sure that we don't get distracted by other people? Well, there's a very simple solution. Here's what you do. You find for yourself the silliest hat you have. You see, here's mine. You put on the silliest hat you can find, and we call this the concentration crown. So we have an 11-year-old little girl, and every time my daughter sees that daddy is wearing the concentration crown, that means I'm to be left alone. And so I've interrupted her interrupting me, okay? I've hacked back the distraction by using some kind of signal, just like those nurses use, to tell people this is not the time to interrupt me. Very, very effective technique. Another thing we can do is to use our technology, to use our, our devices to help us uh, remove distractions. So this is a, a, a function that comes on everybody's iPhone and Android devices today. This is called Do Not Disturb While Driving. Do Not Disturb While Driving works like this. Every time you need to do uh, your, your whatever it is you plan to do, uh, work on an assignment, uh, focus on a project that you're working on, you open up your phone, you push one button, and if someone needs you, if someone calls or texts you during that time, they receive this automatic reply, as you see there on the right, that says, I can't talk right now, but if this is urgent, if this message is urgent, text me with the word urgent. And if they type in U-R-G-E-N-T, then the message will come through. This is on everybody's phone. It's incredibly effective. I suggest you use it. Let me tell you, I've been using this for about four years. Nobody has ever texted me through and said it's that urgent because people know, okay, he'll get back to me in 30 minutes, maybe 45 minutes, and that's fine. So it's a very, very effective technique. Another thing we can do is to clear away the cognitive clutter on our desktops. How many of us have devices or laptops that look like this, that are full of these distractions? We don't have to live like this, right? We can clear away all that cognitive clutter, all of those external triggers, which psychologists tell us reduces our effectiveness and makes us more likely to get distracted. Another thing we can do is to remove all those notifications from our phones, right? We don't need all those pings and dings. Take, take just a few minutes and remove the external triggers that don't serve you. What we have to ask ourselves is this critical question. Is the external trigger serving me or am I serving it? So if the external trigger is serving you, if it's moving you towards traction, if it's reminding you that it's time for that meeting, it's time for that exercise, it's time for that phone call, wonderful. If that's what you plan to do according to your time box schedule, then that external trigger is great. But if it's a ping or ding that interrupts you in the middle of doing something else, let's say spending time with your daughter as I was, and now I have something on my phone that's now pulling me away from somebody I love very much, well, now it's a distraction and that's not serving me. So ask yourself that critical question, is the external trigger serving you or are you serving it? Change those notifications accordingly. And let's make sure that when we meet together, whether it's in a business context, when we go back to the office, or it's with our families at home, that whenever we are present with people in our lives, if we are going to be physically present, we need to be there both in body and mind. So we need to leave those distracting devices outside of certain gatherings, right? We need to have what we call no phone zones 
when we are with the important people in our life, both at, both at work and at home. Finally, the last step to becoming indistractable is about preventing distraction with pacts. Now, pacts are these last resort. This is the firewall that helps make sure we don't get distracted. So the first recorded case of someone using one of these pacts comes to us from the story of Ulysses in the Odyssey. Ulysses is this Greek hero who has to sail his ship past the island of the Sirens. Now, the Sirens are these mythical creatures who sing this magical song, and any sailor that hears the siren song crashes his ship onto the shore of the island of the Sirens and dies. Now, Ulysses knows this is going to happen, so he has to make a pact. He has to take a promise today to make sure he doesn't get distracted tomorrow, so he doesn't do something he doesn't want to do. What does he do? How does he make this pact? He puts, he tells his crew to put beeswax inside their ears so they can't hear the siren song. And then he instructs them to bind him to the mast of the ship. And he tells them, no matter what I do, no matter what I say, do not let me go. And you know what? It works. He's able to sail his ship past the island of the sirens and return his crew and his ship safely home. Now, I hope the metaphor here is clear. You are Ulysses there in the right corner. There's lots of distracting stuff out there. And of course, that could also be you there dead on the shore of the Sirens Island. So how do we, uh, how do we learn from Ulysses? Well, we make Ulysses pacts. We make these promises with ourselves or with other people. And ironically enough, we can use tech to block out tech distraction. So these are two tools I use almost every single day. On the right-hand side, there is a, an app called Self-Control that I use on my desktop. So when I need to do reflective work, work that I don't want uh, interruption, uh, as a last resort to make sure that I don't check Facebook or uh, the news or Google something or email, I use this app that blocks out those websites when I'm doing reflective work. On the left-hand side is a great app called Forest. Now here's how Forest works. When I need to do reflective work, when I need to concentrate and I don't want to let myself get distracted, I open up this app, I type in how much time I want to do reflective work for, and when I hit go, this cute little virtual tree is planted. Okay, you see that cute little virtual tree? Now, if I pick up my phone and I do anything with it, that cute little virtual tree dies. Now, I don't wanna kill the virtual tree, and so it's enough of a reminder to say, nope, you made a promise to yourself that you are going to stay focused on that thing you wanted to do for that for the remainder of that time period. Very, very effective technique. Another thing you can do is to find a focused friend. If you find somebody that you say, okay, for the next 30 minutes, 45 minutes, an hour, whatever it might be, we're both going to keep each other accountable. We're gonna work next to each other. Very, very effective tactic. And I know many of us are working from home today. Maybe we don't have a colleague around that you can do this with. No problem, technology to the rescue. This is a company I like so much. I actually invested in the company. It's called focusmate.com. Here's what you do. You go to focusmate.com, you find a time when you want to do your reflective work. You book that time with a focus mate. And in that time, you show up, make sure you show up on time or else you get a bad review. But when you show up, you see the other person there on the screen, that little video monitor. This was an example, a, a screenshot I took when I, I was working uh, alongside another person. This, this uh, person was a, a medical school student in the, in the Czech Republic who was memorizing anatomy. And having that other person there, keeping me accountable, right? They were working on their thing, I'm working on, on my thing. Incredibly effective, very simple tool to help us stay on track by making a pre-commitment with another person. So we can reduce distraction with packs. We can use technology to block out technology distractions, but be careful because this technique, I have to warn you, can backfire, okay? It can backfire for two reasons. Number one, some people use it out of order. And it's very important that you understand this comes last, okay? This is the last resort. This is the fail safe. This is what we do after we have mastered the internal triggers, after we have made time for traction, after we hack back external triggers, this is the last line of defense. The other way that this backfires is for some people, when they fall off track, as everybody invariably does on the path to becoming indistractable, some people have a lot of difficulty getting back on track. 
right? And so what is the difference between those people who just quit and those who become indistractable? The difference is self-compassion. Studies find that people who are more self-compassionate are much more likely to reach their long-term goals. Well, how do we cultivate self-compassion? It's actually quite simple. We talk to ourselves the way we would talk to a good friend. Maybe the way you would talk to me if I told you about what happened with my daughter. If I told you I was embarrassed about how I had allowed myself to become distracted when I was with someone I love very much, would you tell me I'm a horrible human being? Would you tell me I'm a terrible father? Not if you were my friend, you wouldn't, right? And yet that's the kind of things I used to say to myself all the time. And it wasn't helpful and it wasn't true. And here's what else isn't true. This myth that technology is addicting everyone, that it's hijacking our brains, that there's nothing we can do about it. It is not helpful and it is not true because there's so much we can do. We can master the internal triggers. We can make time for traction. We can hack back the external triggers and we can prevent distraction with PAC. And so that's the high level summary of indistractable, these four big strategies that anyone can use to become indistractable. What we haven't really gotten into depth around are the tactics or how do we put all this into practice? The book is jam packed with very practical techniques that you can use, including a chapter on how to build an indistractable workplace, right? What happens if your boss is constantly interrupting you? How do you build an indistractable workplace? How do you raise indistractable kids? Right, very important. If you think the world is distracting now, just wait a few years. It's only going to become more distracting. So how do we raise indistractable kids? How do we have an indistractable relationship? Even how do we become indistractable lovers? All that's in the book. I hope you'll check that out. And the message I wanna leave with you in closing is that we can do this. That this narrative that, that there's nothing we can do about this, the technology is hijacking our brains is simply not true. And in fact, believing it's true perpetuating this myth makes it worse. It's called learned helplessness. Because when people believe there's nothing they can do about a problem, what do they do? They stop trying. And then we've truly lost the war. You see, I really do believe that we can get the best out of these technologies without letting them get the best of us. We can all become indistractable. Thank you so much. And with that, uh, just leave up this slide for just another moment here. I have a favor to ask. If you'd be so kind to just uh, take this quick survey for me, you can go to opinion2.us. You can see it there on the screen, opinion2.us. Uh, that URL, by the way, it's not .com, it's opinion2.us. If you go to that website or if you have an iPhone, you can actually just point it to that, that QR code and it'll take you straight to that website. Uh, I would love to know what you thought of the presentation. Just five quick questions. would love to know what you thought. Uh, and if you do that, you'll get access to my slide share page where you can have all the slides you just saw. Uh, feel free to share them uh, you know, with friends, family, neighbors, uh, workplace, that, those are for you to share. And if we don't get to your question today, we only have about 15 minutes for questions, but if we don't get to your question, please feel free to reach out to me on my website. You can see the address there, nearandfar.com. Uh, there's, a, there's a section there where you can uh, contact me to answer any questions you might have. And with that, I would love to take some questions. Thank you, uh, Nir. That was uh, everything I expected from this conversation. And I'm, uh, and I'm sure our audience out there enjoyed it as much. Uh, so earlier in the time, we had David Allen's team share their formula on getting things done with us. And this session gives us another unique perspective to get better at doing things and achieving more in life. So, Neil, thank you very much for um, you know sharing your thoughts with us and our audience. Uh, a message to our audience, uh, please keep your questions coming in. Uh, we have a lucky draw here, a question that Neil will pick on random will be adjudged the question, the lucky question, and the lucky winner will get a prize from us. So please keep your questions pouring in. Neil will just pick any question at random. Uh, and Neil says that all questions are good, only answers can be bad. So please let your questions come in. And if we have time, we will ask all those questions. Otherwise, as Neil suggested, you know where to find him to get answers to the rest of the questions. So uh, Neil, before I get into the questions uh, from the audience, I have one question of mine. Um, sure which I want to ask. You are an entrepreneur. 
investor, teacher, and now an author too. And in my experience, most people find it difficult to be good at one thing, but you're good at everything. So what was your drive? <laughs> How did you go about achieving all the success? I, I want you well, to share that with our audience so that they can learn to excel in everything they want to do. Well, I, I, I appreciate the compliment. I, I will tell you that, uh, you know, I don't write books when I have the answer. I write books when I'm looking for the answer. So with both my books, I was looking for how to build habit forming products. I couldn't find the book to tell me how to do that. Uh, when I was looking for how to become indistractable, I couldn't find a book to help me do that. I read every book on the topic, including David Allen's book, and I didn't find what I was looking for. I didn't find a technique that really worked for me. And so that's why I wrote these books. You know, I write to learn, not to, to teach necessarily. If other people enjoy it, then wonderful. That's great. But really, I write for myself first and foremost. And I think that you know, th this hasn't been an easy journey for me. I don't have a lot of self-control. I never have. I don't have a lot of willpower. I never have. As I mentioned, I used to be clinically obese. Uh, and, and so, you know, what I discovered is, and, and in interviewing hundreds of people, both people who are easily distracted and people who are indistractable, is that the people who are indistractable, they don't have a lot of self-control. They don't have a lot of self-discipline. What they have is a system. They have a practice in place which makes sure that when distraction rears its ugly head, they are prepared. And so when they plan ahead, they don't have to expend a lot of willpower. You see, if there's one mantra I want you to remember from my book, it's that the antidote to impulsiveness is forethought. The antidote to impulsiveness is forethought. Distraction, procrastination, uh, the, the question to Plato's 2,500-year-old question of why do we do things against our better interests, it's all about impulse control. It's not a moral failing. It's not uh, a character flaw. It's an impulse control problem. And so the good news is that our species, you see, mankind has this amazing evolutionary trait, which is that we can see the future with higher fidelity than any other animal on the face of the earth. We can see what is going to happen what is likely to happen better than any other animal. And so what that means, therefore, is that we can plan ahead. Because if you wait till the last moment, if you wait till the chocolate cake is on the fork on its way to your mouth, you're going to eat it. If you wait till the cigarette is lit in your hand, you're going to smoke it. If you sleep next to your cell phone on your nightstand every night, it's going to be the first thing you pick up in the morning because you've already lost. It's too late. You have to make plans today to prevent getting distracted tomorrow, which is why you need a system. And that system affects every aspect of your life. And so to answer your question, you know, today I'm 42 years old. I've never been in better shape than I am today. I've, even when I was a teenager, I wasn't as physically fit as I am today. I used to be clinically obese. Uh, I get more work done. I'm more professionally productive than I've ever been before. I have a better relationship with my wife than ever before because I'm fully present with her. I have to spend more time and, and, and have a better relationship with my daughter than ever before because becoming indistractable is the macro skill. It's the skill of the century, and there is no area of your life that's not affected by your ability to sustain attention. Thank you, uh, Neer. So I'm going to just open the house for questions from our audience. I've got one from Divya Sivakumar here, and I'm going to read out to you. What about the times when you have to multitask? So can multitasking and remaining indistractable coexist? And, and yeah, so, okay. yeah, multitasking is an interesting topic because the orthodoxy says that you can't multitask, right? We've all heard this a million times. You can't multitask, so don't even try. That's not actually quite right, that uh, obviously we can multitask. We do multiple things all the time. Have you ever driven your car and had a conversation with the person next to you? Uh, have you ever taken a walk while uh, uh, making a phone call? Of course you can do multiple things at a time. Who says you can't multitask? That's stupid. What you can't do is you can't input information at the, on, a, on one channel at the same time. So for example, you can't listen to a podcast in one ear and a different podcast in the other. You can't solve two math problems at the same time. You can't watch two television shows at the same time because they're both using the same input channel, either sight, sound, right? They're, when you use the same channel at the same time, it doesn't work. 
But what you can do and what's an amazing time-saving technique is called multi-channel multitasking. And so what I do is I have certain practices, certain rules about how I consume media. And I use what's called temptation bundling. Temptation bundling is this idea that you can take one thing that you don't really like doing and you can bundle it with something you do enjoy doing it to make it more likely to, for you to do that thing that you don't really enjoy. And so here's how it works. Okay, so I mentioned I used to be clinically obese and I've always hated exercise. For as long as I can remember, I just don't like exercise. But now for the first time in my life, I exercise consistently every time I say I will. And one of the ways that I make it sweeter, that I make it a practice I enjoy, is that my practice is that I'm only allowed to consume content while I'm exercising. And what is that content? So another problem I used to have was that when I was online, I'd see an article on the news and I'd say, oh, let me just read that real quick. And then of course, you know where this is going to lead. It leads to another article and another article because every media company out there, they want to suck you in, right? Whether it's the New York Times or whatever, the Times of India, everybody wants your time and attention. They design those headlines as clickbait. They want you to keep reading. They don't care how much time you have. They want all of it. And so I don't do that anymore. As a rule, when I see an article online, I save it. I never read articles on my web browser. I only read them inside an app called Pocket. It's a great app. It's free. That What Pocket does, it digests that article. It strips out all the links, all the ads, all the distracting stuff. And it even will read it to you. It has this beautiful text-to-speech functionality. And so I'll listen to articles that I would have otherwise wasted time on every time I exercise. And so that's a wonderful example of multi-channel multitasking. Thank you, Neil. I see a bunch of questions that get answered uh, um, with this for our audience over there because a lot of people have uh, questions around multitasking and how to get better at that. So thanks for that, uh, Neil. Uh, there's a question from Preetam. Uh, what Preetam wants to know is that emotions are uh, natural and you know involuntary. So how do you overcome emotions uh, when you are focusing on distraction tactics? Yeah, so these are the internal triggers. And it's important to realize that they are the underlying cause of distraction. Most people don't realize that. They blame the distraction. They blame the thing they do to escape the distraction. Uh, I'm sorry, to escape the internal trigger, I should say. Uh, and, and they look for some kind of relief to get out of their heads, whether it's taking a, a drink to take their minds off their problem, whether it's scrolling the news to worry about somebody else's problem halfway around the world, as opposed to thinking about your own problems, uh, whether it's uh, watching too much television, too much cricket, whatever. When we do these things, none of them are necessarily bad. What's bad about it is if we turn to them out of habit to escape uncomfortable sensations. That's when this practice becomes harmful as opposed to helpful. So there's nothing wrong with watching a cricket match as long as you do it on your schedule when you plan to do it rather than, you know, because you're feeling bored or lonesome or, or uncertain or whatever it is that you're looking to escape discomfort. So the first step to becoming indistractable, as we talked about, is about mastering those internal triggers. And so there's all kinds of tactics that you can use to disarm that discomfort, to deal with it, to process it in a healthy way that leads you towards traction rather than distraction. One of the best pieces of advice I can give you in, in terms of how do you handle that emotional distress is to disavow this idea that feeling bad is bad. You see, many people in the self-help community these days preach this message that we're supposed to all be happy all the time, that we're supposed to feel good constantly, that if you're not feeling awesome 100% of the time, something's wrong with you, that that emotion needs to be escaped. That is not true, okay? Feeling bad is not bad. In fact, our species has evolved to be perpetually perturbed. We are designed to always want more. Think about it from an evolutionary basis. If there was ever a tribe of Homo sapiens that was sitting on the savanna perfectly happy and content, our ancestors probably killed and ate them, right? Because what's your motivation to improve your life if you don't feel those internal triggers? So internal triggers are not bad. 
they can be the rocket fuel to help us make the world and our lives better. We can harness the boredom, the uncertainty, the fear, the, the, the anxiety to help us build new inventions, discover new medicines, overturn despots, reach for the moon. It's the same emotions that can drive us towards traction rather than distraction. So don't believe that just because you feel bad, that's a bad thing. Quite the opposite. It's about harnessing that discomfort to help move you towards healthy traction rather than harmful distraction. Great. My message to the audience, keep your questions coming in. One lucky question is going to win the prize. So I see a lot of questions pouring in. Uh, keep them coming. Uh, Neer, the next question is from uh, Rajat. And I think this is more pertinent to the times that we are in. So what will normal look like post COVID-19? Your views on that and will this change everything? And world has seen many crises in the past from health to economic. What is different about this crisis and how would that result in uh, sustained behavior changes among people? Well, so I'll, I'll try and keep it under the scope of what I study, which is distraction and uh, uh, habits. And um, I, I will say that I think that there's a lot of positive that can come out of this current COVID crisis. Of course, we wouldn't wish for this, but if we're stuck in it already, uh, there's a lot of upside that I don't know if people recognize. I think uh, you know some of the benefits include the practice that many of us have gotten into of scheduling time for the people who matter to us. You know, many of us today, we schedule those Zoom calls, we schedule the, the, the time to connect with the people we love most. And this is a big change from what we used to do, right? Many people, they just give their loved ones whatever time is left over, whatever scraps of time and, you know, minutes in their day that they can spare for the people in their lives. Well, today what we're doing is we're checking in on our parents by saying, okay, I'm going to call you every Tuesday at 6 p.m. We're having these Zoom conference calls with our best friends. And I think that is something that has been missing, that we know that since about the 1950s, at least in the United States, there's been this trend, uh, this loneliness epidemic, because people haven't had that scheduled time on their calendars to reconnect with people. So I hope that is a practice that we continue in the future, having that regularly scheduled time to connect with the people who matter to us in our lives, whether that's our parents, our kids, our spouses, our friends, that's an important thing to hold time on your calendar and protect. Thanks, Neil. And there's one coming from Mayush, a very practical one. Uh, and he wants to know, I find a lot of productivity is lost because of incessant emails and calls. So how does one sensitize uh, colleagues to the importance of leaving you alone and, uh, uh, you know, without seeming rude or un unappropriate? Yeah. Okay. So uh, let me actually take that in two parts. So uh, the, the, the rude and inappropriate, okay? We don't want to be rude. We don't want to be inappropriate. The best thing you can do to help others become indistractable is to become indistractable yourself. So whether that's with your colleagues, whether that's with your kids, you know, I see a lot of parents complaining about how their kids won't stop playing video games. And meanwhile, they're saying, get off, stop playing video games while they're checking Facebook and email on their phones. It doesn't work that way. We cannot be hypocrites. We have to set a good example. In the workplace, it's the same thing. That the first step to helping others become indistractable is to become indistractable yourself, to show them how to live life better by becoming indistractable. And look, we've been here before. You know, in the United States, at least, we had a much worse habit, which used to be smoking. It used to be that about 40% of the United States population smoked, uh, adult population. Today, it's about 14%. And a big reason why this changed was that it became socially unacceptable to smoke in private areas. So uh, it used to be when you walked into someone's home, everybody had ashtrays. My mom, I remember my mother had ashtrays in our living room. Uh, and people just expected to smoke in your living room, whether you smoked or not. This was in the 1980s. Everybody did this. Today, that would be unheard of. You would never walk into someone's home and just light up a cigarette. Uh, and in fact, smoking has, been, has become something that the lower classes do. It's become a low status behavior to be a smoker. And that happened not because of laws. It happened because of a cultural change. It happened because of people like my mother, when someone came over and thought, oh, I'm just going to light a cigarette in your home. She said, oh, I'm sorry. We are non-smokers. 
we do not smoke. If you'd like to smoke, if you'd kindly go outside. And that type of cultural change, doing something a bit different, meant that she was on the cutting edge. And yes, it felt a little bit uncomfortable. It was a little bit odd. It was a little bit unusual. But that's what it takes to make social change. We need people, everyone listening to the sound of my voice right now, to start calling themselves indistractable, just like someone would call themselves a non-smoker. Having that identity, having that moniker, this is called an identity pact, makes you more likely to do what you say you're going to do and helps create what's called social antibodies. It protects society when people have these new norms of behavior. So whether you've read the book or not, doesn't matter. Today, you can call yourself indistractable because already, if you've stuck with me this long, you are the kind of person who strives to do what they say they're going to do. So we need some bravery. We need some courage to start this movement to people who say, you know what? My time, my attention, my life is not going to be controlled and manipulated by others. I am indistractable. So that's that's a big part of it. The other part, and there's a lot more about the book. I'm, unfortunately, we don't have a lot of time to go into it, but there's a whole section of the book about how to change the workplace. Because what we see is that distraction at work is a symptom of cultural dysfunction. Many people think it's the emails, the Slack channels. It's not. It's not the technology. It's about the culture of the company. And I show you there's these three attributes of an indistractable workplace that anyone can bring to the culture of their workplace environment that help people stay focused, help preserve their concentration and become indistractable. Thanks, Dee. I think I'll just take last two questions. We've got a bunch over here, but with your permission, last two questions. Uh, this one I like uh, that I see on my screen from Ganesh Subramaniam. And his question is, what do you think about procrastination as an idea generator and a creative release? No, not true. Uh, what you can call it is a diversion. Okay, diversions of attention are fine, but distraction is never good. By definition, procrastination is not helpful ever. Now, what you can, you can plan those things, right? You can say, look, I want time to play video games. I want time to meditate. I want time to pray. I want time to stare at the ceiling. Fine, do it, but plan that in your day. Because if you are getting distracted by the very definition of the term, you are doing something you did not plan to do. So it's never helpful. Procrastination is never a good thing. Distraction is never a good thing. Diversion, on the other hand, can be a good thing. A diversion is defined as a refocusing of attention. So if you want to watch a movie, watch a movie, enjoy it, right? If you want to play video games, play video games, enjoy it. But that's not a distraction as long as it's planned for. Remember, the time you plan to waste is not wasted time. Here's the thing. One of the benefits of becoming indistractable is that you, for the first time, will actually enjoy leisure. Most people listening to me right now have never experienced what it really means to enjoy leisure time because I know what you do. Even when you're with your kids, even when you're with your friends, even when you're watching a movie or reading a book, in the back of your head, if you're a top performer, if you're an A-type personality, someone who's a high achiever, in the back of your head, you're thinking, oh, I didn't finish everything on my to-do list, or, oh, I bet I have some emails waiting for me, or I wonder if I should just you know, do that other thing. You can't really enjoy even the leisure time, right? And so that's such a huge benefit of becoming indistractable because now the leisure time becomes exactly what you plan to do. Now that is traction, whether it's scrolling Facebook or WhatsApp or Instagram or watching a movie, reading a book, that is exactly what you plan to do. It is now traction rather than distraction because that's what you are doing with intent. Thanks, you. So the last question for the session before I ask you to pick a random question, um, which is the lucky question for today. Uh, this question is from Prabhnesh Mohanty and he wants to know that if you're going through an emotionally low phase in your life, how can you be indistractable? Yeah, so it's really down to those two answers. There's only two potential solutions. Either fix the source of the discomfort or learn tactics to cope with it in a healthier manner. 
Okay, so uh, this is really about understanding what is in your scope of control. What can you do something about? And if you can do something about the problem, you absolutely should fix it. So if it's a difficult home life situation or uh, a, a business problem, if you can fix it, I want you to fix it, right? Because that discomfort, that emotional discomfort is telling you something. It's a signal that something needs to be fixed. Now, you can't fix every bad feeling, right? Sometimes the only other answer is to learn tactics to cope with it. And so that's where we use these other techniques that I talked about earlier, like the 10 minute rule. There's many others I describe in the book, reimagining the task, reimagining the trigger, reimagining your temperament, lots of other tactics we can use, but it's only one of those techniques. Fix the source of the problem or learn tactics to cope with it in a way that leads towards traction rather than distraction. And what we find is that agency, that autonomy, that feeling in control is a huge factor in human happiness. So the more you are indistractable, the more you do what you say you're going to do, the more you live with personal integrity, this is how we get out of those low points, right? De depression is actually defined by this state where people feel that nothing they do matters, right? That nothing they do will change their situation. That's what it means to be depressed. And so the way to get out of that is to start feeling, wait a minute, I can affect change. When I say I'm going to do something, I do it. If I say I'm going to exercise, I do it. If I say I'm going to spend time with my kids, I do it. If I say I'm going to work on that book I want to write or that project or that business I'm trying to pitch, that's what I do. This is exactly how we get out of those emotional low, low points in our lives. Thank you so much, uh, Neera. There are a bunch of questions out there, which uh, unfortunately due to time constraint, we won't be able to take. But uh, one thing is for sure, each one of your questions can be answered in Nir's book, Indistractable. Um, so I would urge you to lay your hands on that, find answer to these questions. And if you still want to, uh, you have more conversations to have with Nir, you know where to uh, find Nir. Uh, write to him and I'm sure he'll be happy to respond. Thank you very much, uh, Nir. It was a very, very insightful session indeed. Uh, there are a lot of things that stay with me. Uh, from what you said, first and foremost, uh, you know, we need to deal with our internal discomfort, this whole social emotional state that leads us to escape. I think that's something that really resonates with me. Uh, and that's honestly where everything, where change begins. The other things that I would take away from this session, and there are many more, uh, surely, but if you don't plan your day, somebody else will. I think nothing can be more truer than that. A lot of our audience have asked questions around that. You got answer, you heard from the master himself. Uh, and I'm sure that you would use some of these techniques that me has uh, suggested to become a better self uh, going forward. So with that, thank you so much, Neil, for your time. It was such a pleasure to have you with us, spending time and sharing your thoughts with our audience. I'm sure everybody enjoyed this. Um, and for our audience, you've been uh, awesome. Thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, just a quick word here. We have uh, more exciting speakers. Uh, we have more exciting sessions. Uh, and as exciting speakers as Neer planned up. Uh, we've got two sessions coming up. One is with uh, Harish Bijur, who's a brand consultant uh, uh, in India. And we've got uh, David uh, Akar coming on the show as well. And I'm sure you don't want to miss those sessions. So please stay tuned. Uh, log on to our uh, uh, Facebook and LinkedIn page. Get to know when these sessions are happening and learn with us. Thank you very much, everyone, for joining us today. Thank you very much, Neer, for being with us. Thank you.